So we're here with Aswat the Motor and Professor of Finance at the Stern School on almost every list globally for the top 10 professors or teachers in graduate education. And at the Stern School, where there are 190 faculty, has been named best professor by the students nine years in a row and is the leading scholar on the topic of evaluation. Aswath, let's kick right into it. You've been doing a lot of research around the value of a subscriber, or how you build up as opposed to bottoms down the value of a company based on subscribers, users, et cetera. Say more. Well, I'd love to say I've done a lot of research. I've just started exploring it and there's so much more left to do. Because I think if you look at the traditional ways we value companies, we value them from the top down. We project mm -hmm. our total revenues, we subtract our total expenses, we come up with income and cash flows, and we value the company. Mm -hmm. The reality is we've shifted to a world where companies are focused on users, subscribers, members, because it seems like that's the way they think about value. And perhaps it's time for us to start thinking about valuation from the bottom up, from thinking about users, the value of a user, building up to the value of a company. Because I don't think we're asking the right questions when we look at these companies that are user or subscriber based. What are those questions? Well, one of those questions is, you know, you've got lots of users. Mm -hmm. How intense are these users? Mm -hmm. Are they on your, you know, are they with you an hour a day, 20 minutes a day, two Engagement. minutes a day? Engagement matters. Yep. How loyal are these users, mm -hmm. right? To the extent that they stay on with you, they're worth more. How likely is it that you can sell these users more things? So in a sense, I need to know more about your users to decide whether users are worth nothing or whether they're mm -hmm. worth $100 or $1,000 a user. So give me an example of a very valuable user or member versus not so valuable and attach it to a company. Okay. Let's start with Netflix, right? A mm -hmm. Netflix subscriber is valuable for two reasons. One is they're locked in. They mm -hmm. have a subscription agreement. We know from, from studies of psychology mm -hmm. that when somebody opts into something, they're more likely to stay on if they don't, if, if, if to get out of it, they have to opt out. Mm -hmm. So Netflix has, has subscribers who provide them with revenues that are, in a sense, you can count on. It's valuable to the extent that those revenues, you, you know exactly what you're going to renewal make. Renewal rates. You know, it, it, it must have 95 plus exactly. percent renewal rates. So, and so from that perspective, a Netflix subscriber is worth a lot. Mm -hmm. An Amazon Prime subscriber is worth a lot for a different reason. It's not the $99 a year that mm -hmm. makes them valuable. I mean, even though it's 70 million members, $99 still works out a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that they buy $400, $500, $600 right. worth of merchandise and that keeps going up because the more they buy, there's a networking ben benefit that Amazon mm -hmm. gets, which is the more people buy on Amazon Prime, the more likely it is that they buy more stuff on Amazon yep. Prime. That ecosystem gets richer over time. So an Amazon Prime subscriber is worth a lot simply because you can count on growth for a longer time. We measure our business looking at those two things. There's renewal, mm -hmm. so what percentage of the logos are consumers right. renew. And then there's dollar renewal, and that is of the people who were your members the year before, the next year of that $100, is it 80, is it 100, is it 140? And it looks, like Netflix must have a near perfect renewal rate, right. but I imagine the dollar renewal isn't that much greater, right. whereas Amazon every year figures out a way to exactly. increase it. Give me some members that don't look like they're valuable and the company let's associated say, with it. Let's take a company that I've lost money on, Twitter. Right. Mm -hmm. Twitter has lots of users, but the reality is those users don't seem to be either intense or locked into. They don't. They might not opt out of leave Twitter, but mm -hmm. even when they're on Twitter, they're not on enough of the time that Twitter can do much with them. Mm -hmm. So that's a classic example of a company with lots of users that can't figure out a way to get a high value per user because the users don't see it. And it might not be Twitter's fault. I mean, mm -hmm. they've had management issues. Their, their platform might not lend itself that well to users staying on. Mm -hmm. So when people are building platforms for users, they have to think about platforms that are rich enough that users want to stay on the platform. Mm -hmm. It's something that Facebook has done incredibly well, is make their ecosystem richer and richer mm -hmm. so that it's not just the Facebook posts you're going for, it's mm -hmm. Instagram, it's WhatsApp, it's part of an ecosystem where you're trying to keep people locked into you. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is something we have to increasingly pay attention to, is how locked in are users into your ecosystem, because that's the only way you can sell them more stuff. So Amazon, it appear, would appear to me, yeah. based on intensity, renewal rates, ability for dollar renewal to increase, that they're basically saying, pay us 99 bucks a year so we can sell you more and more stuff. Exactly. Exactly. And it just, and by the way, these relationships are with the most the wealthiest households in the world. Right. So it feels like they could go from whatever a $300 Amazon user is to 700 which is a Prime user, 
it's conceivable they could take them to 7,000. Right. I mean, it's just, I don't see anything that has a more valuable user base than Amazon. Yeah. And I think that that's absolutely true. The, the biggest cost that Amazon has faced with its Prime members is the shipping cost. Mm -hmm. it co I mean, if you look at the, the I the think the last year, it's seven and a half billion dollars yep. on shipping costs just for Prime members. Yep. And in a sense, it gives you an opening as to why Whole Foods might have been a good buy for them. It's mm -hmm. got nothing to do with being in the grocery business, which is a horrible business to be mm -hmm. in, given its margins. It's a fact that you now have distribution centers in some of the wealthiest zip codes in the country, mm -hmm. where you can deliver stuff without having to send things 3,000, 5,000, 8,000 miles. Just the distribution system for Amazon with its prime membership is worth a lot. There's a side issue too with Amazon, which is it's not just that people are buying more on Amazon, it's the destruction you're creating in the rest of the space. Mm -hmm. The one way I describe Amazon is, I don't know whether Amazon will succeed in the businesses they're in, but one thing we know, the businesses they They'll go into, others. they will destroy yeah. everybody else in the space. Yeah. The benefit they get from that is as you destroy your competition, where mm -hmm. else are your prime members going to go but to come back to you? Well, to your point, they didn't buy a thir they, they didn't spend thirteen dollar thirteen billion dollars for a half of for a five hundred million operating income company. They spent thirteen billion dollars for greater intensity across their exactly. the fifty eight percent of households they have this ongoing relationship with. So let's talk about Amazon. And I had chills go down my spine yesterday when you said that you thought you had a difficult time seeing how Amazon would run from here, that it was sort of priced to perfection. I've been saying that for seven years. Yeah. So in a sense, let me start off by admitting that over the last seven years, I've mm -hmm. looked at Amazon and said, I don't see how Amazon can pull this off. And each time the market keeps pushing the price higher. Mm -hmm. There are times when you got to ask, stop and ask, am I missing something in the company? And the question I keep asking myself, is there something the market sees here that I'm not seeing? And there is this, this, this small opening where you can get to the value. And that small opening requires almost a conspiratorial view of the world, where Amazon essentially becomes the only game in town. Yeah. So I hope the antitrust across happens, several sectors. Across several sectors. Yeah, yeah. And if that happens, you could argue they're worth what they are. But the question is, what's the rest of the world doing while this is happening? Yeah. Are the antitrust people letting this go through? So I think that that pathway to get to the value seems mm -hmm. to be so low probability that I'm not willing to bet on it. But I'm not willing to bet against it either. Mm -hmm. The nature of this game, and I, I tell uh, any time I talk about companies like Amazon, I warn people, don't get too caught up in your conviction about the company. Because mm -hmm. your conviction is going to be stomped by what the market sentiment is. Mm -hmm. The market sentiment with Amazon is so powerful yeah. that if you try to bet against it, you're going to be bankrupt before you're right. Because ultimately, and this is dangerous talk, but because ultimately it seems like with almost every stock or company in history, there is a reckoning with it. The traditional metrics that you understand are applied. Yeah. That doesn't seem to have happened with Amazon. It seems that the core competence, and I think this is increasingly true of much of a lot of equities, is storytelling. Yeah. And their ability to exert strategic power across not just online retail, but now offline retail, media, yeah. digital marketing, streaming video, grocery now. I, my sense is if, if Bezos tomorrow said we see overnight delivery as a huge opportunity, the $150 billion in market cap of DHL, FedEx, and UPS would begin leaking Absolutely. to Amazon just on a Jedi mind trick right. of I'm focused on this right, right now. Is there a chance that it could go to a trillion dollars just based on the sentiment, the general sentiment that Amazon is about to become the most dominant player in the largest, highest EBITDA consumer businesses in the world? and continue this anti-gravity bucket where it just totally decouples from the metrics you're talking about? Now, I, I think Amazon is the perfect illustration of the power of telling the same story consistently over mm -hmm. time and acting consistently with that story. Mm -hmm. Because there are, every company tries to tell a story, but most companies don't stay true to a story. Their story keeps changing depending on whatever's hot. Jeff Bezos has said the same story since now. I, I've still, uh, that, that letter from 1997 that everybody mm -hmm. I'm sure has read about what he said Amazon, that letter still captures how the company is Speed, convenience, today. price, we'll exactly. invest big and, across and, the street. We, we care about revenues, we'll let mm -hmm. the profits come. I mm -hmm. called it a field of dreams company a long mm -hmm. time ago mm -hmm. because their view is if we build it, they will come and mm -hmm. they've been consistent with that notion. I think the problem though is 
the success of Amazon has created a lot of Amazon wannabes. When you say wannabe, you mean people who are, are, are spending, losing a ton of money exactly. in this field of dream strategy. Exactly. Because I think in a sense what Amazon has pulled off is, is unique. Yeah. I don't think other companies, so when you see Uber in a, in a sense try to, be an, to pull off the Amazon, I'm mm -hmm. not sure that car service lends itself as easily mm -hmm. to what Amazon did. So I think a lot of companies look at Amazon and say, well, only we could do what Amazon mm -hmm. does. We're going to be as successful. I think they're going down a very dangerous path. With Amazon, the question is what that reckoning, what form that reckoning will take. Mm -hmm. You saw a little bit of it last year when you started to see the stories shift a little bit, where mm -hmm. Amazon started to focus on profits finally. They did a couple of things like lay off people, which they've not done before. But you saw growth taper off a little bit. I mean, it's still pretty high. Mm -hmm. But the company seemed to be saying, look, you know, we're going to look at margins a lot more than we used to. I think you're going to see a lot more of that in the coming decade, where you're going to see Amazon take actions where they put margins ahead of revenue growth in some sectors. But the thing about Amazon is while they do it in some sectors, in other sectors, they're reclaiming that old strategy. So you're going to see a mix of strategies in different businesses in Amazon. I wouldn't be surprised if you started to see the profit margins start to improve, at least in some of the sectors that have been around for 15 or 20 years. So you think this is an overt strategy. I've always thought that perhaps that Amazon got into businesses, specifically the cloud, where they couldn't help but be profitable, and that they actually... Every quarter they announce a profit, Bezos calls management into a room and says, you screwed up, green light every expensive thing. You believe that it is an overt strategy yeah. to start becoming more profitable. I, I think so, and I think that in a sense, it, 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 when you get to be a half a trillion dollar company, six, mm -hmm. you, at some point in time, you have to start thinking about profits simply because you have so many ambitions you got to fund with those cash flows. You can't keep running at this mm -hmm. you know, low profit margin strategy. So I think you're going to start to see margins start to improve at Amazon. So companies, everybody follows the leader. I see this in the private market ecosystem where VCs encourage all of us, including us, we were a VC-backed company, to grow and be special and ignore profits or losses. So let's talk about some companies. Uh, Snap, uh, 400 million in revenues, 500 million in losses. How do you value a company like that? Yesterday you said at some point you thought it would be undervalued. What, right now, what is it, $15, $16 billion market cap? Right. Talk to us about Snap. I think with the, with the Snap's pathway to profitability is, is a fairly straightforward and they can pull it off, which mm -hmm. is they've got 160 to 200 million in fairly intense users. They're not mm -hmm. Twitter-like. They're, cl they're halfway between Twitter and Facebook in terms mm -hmm. of intensity. Mm -hmm. That's their strongest point. The, the weaker link is these are 20 to 30 year olds. Historically, they've been- You think that's weak, because advertisers love it. They, it's weak simply because we know. I, mm -hmm. I, know, I have a 27 year old, yeah. a 23, uh, they're fickle. They're, yeah. right? Today it's Snap, God only knows what it'll be tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. If Instagram is cooler than Snap for some reason, mm -hmm. they're going to be on Instagram. So that's the weaker link, is we don't know whether mm -hmm. they'll be as loyal as 40 to 50 year custom, mm -hmm. old cu customers. There is a pathway, I think, for Snap to become a successful company, but they've got to stay focused. So where, uh, in terms of where it is now, wildly overvalued, about the same, wait and see? It's not wildly overvalued, because I've added 11, it's at 14 something. Mm -hmm. I think it's getting pretty close to being interesting. Mm -hmm. It's one bad earnings report away from being a buy for me. Yeah, because all these swings pass. Yeah, right? because it, if you have one bad earnings report where the user numbers start to taper off, because that's mm -hmm. all people seem to focus on, if mm -hmm. it goes to seven or eight, I'll buy Snap. I mean, Snap at seven or eight to me is a is a pretty good investment because I'm getting 160 million users who are checking their Snap 25, 30 times a day, mm -hmm. and if Snap can then figure out a way to start to deliver, and that's that's the if. I think that's worth at least $10, 11 per share. Mm -hmm. So the right price, I would buy Snap. I think uh, they have a tough path ahead of them simply because they're in a space where two giants suck up all the oxygen, Google and face, uh, Facebook. But I think they have a pathway if they can find a niche in that market that they can cater. And one of those giants, Facebook, seems literally obsessed with putting them out of business. Yeah, exactly. So Uber, $6 billion in revenues, $3 billion in losses. I think those yeah, are the numbers. Right. Uh, give me your sense of value on Uber. I think Uber's basic business model has a problem. Mm -hmm. What allowed them to grow so fast is getting in the way of them making money. What allowed them to grow so fast is they created a no or low capital intensity model. You don't own the cars, you don't hire the drivers. All that Uber needs to do to grow in a city is hire a guy, put him in a motel room, say, mm -hmm. sign up enough drivers, let's get started. That's what allowed them to grow from nothing 
to a $70 billion, at least a pricing for the company, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a five to six year period. Mm -hmm. But that's turning out to be the weakness because in a business with no capital intensity, there are no barriers to entry. There's a lot so, of liquidity. You and I could start a drive it, it, share it, it, market and, and, and essentially, what Uber's original strategy was, mm -hmm. we'll spend the competition into the ground, we'll drive them out of business. Mm -hmm. In 2013 and 14, it looked like they had a shot mm -hmm. because it was so much bigger than everybody else. But then you started to see the other players that tried cash. So everybody's throwing cash into the business. Mm -hmm. Nobody's making money. It's essentially almost like everybody is, you know, is going to price themselves down. I mean, I look at what I pay for an Uber Uber ride and said, there's no way yeah. anybody in this game is making money. Fair not enough. Uber, not the driver. Yeah. It's, it's great for customers, yeah. but this is not a business that's sustainable in the long term. Yeah, 50 bucks to get to the airport, and you know it cost Uber 75. Absolutely. Economically irresponsible not to take Uber everywhere. So wouldn't that, that so that very, uh, Uber has liquidity in every market, and you can, with 30, 50 million bucks, start an Uber competitor. Doesn't that lend itself well then to a company like Airbnb where you need global liquidity, where even if you have rental listings in Houston, you have to have global awareness from everybody coming into Houston. Doesn't that make, doesn't the same thing make Airbnb more valuable, whereas it makes Uber less valuable? Potentially. You know, Airbnb has a potential for global networking benefits. Right. Uber has local networking benefits, which means right. if they dominate a city, they're going to get to a tipping point where they become. So I think for Uber, the key is to change the business model. Mm -hmm. They've got to find a way to make this a more capital-intense model. How would they do that? By that's owning why, the cars? That's why they try, wait, you know, try to get into electric cars, and, mm -hmm. uh, in a sense. But the problem is now they're competing not against Lyft and Didi. They're competing against Google. And the mm -hmm. reality is Google and Apple have enough cash in their checking accounts yeah. to spend you under the ground. So they're entering a space where their competitive advantages are much more minimal. But I think Airbnb does have that advantage of having a potential for a global networking benefit. So Airbnb, I think at a most recent round of about 25 billion, Airbnb, it's, Airbnb uh, excuse me, Uber at 70 billion. You would argue Airbnb probably overvalued. Air, uh, I'm sorry, Uber overvalued. Airbnb, where would you put it? I think Airbnb has. The, I mean, I think at 25 billion is closer to its fair value. Mm -hmm. I think Airbnb has more of an issue now with regulators because that's coming yep. now. Uber has already gone through the brunt of that process, so they're working out some probable, at least, a compromise mm -hmm. where they can live with ride-sharing companies. Because the reality is many cities, without ride-sharing, you can't get from point A to point mm -hmm. B. The taxi cabs can't do it anymore. Airbnb is, I think, getting to the point where the regulators are going to wake up and start being more assertive about what they need to do. Mm -hmm. And I, th it's, I mean, a lot of these, these young disruptive companies live off regulatory arbitrage, initially mm -hmm. at least, which is you see it in fintech, you saw it with Uber. Initially, the regulations that govern the status quo are often meaningless, you know, they're, they're legacy regulations. And what these startups do is they essentially become, are able to succeed because they don't have to deal with those regulations. Mm -hmm. Airbnb increasingly will have to deal with the regulations that hotel companies have had to deal with historically. Yeah, the innovation you know, class plays and, by a different set of and, rules, and, right? And, and once, but once you get to a certain size, the mm -hmm. regulators wake up and say, we're going to pay attention to you. And yeah, we I want you to pay taxes and have, have minimum wage. And, and also that kind of restrictions stuff. on yeah. where you can put it. Your, I mean, you, you're going to see the zoning restrictions yeah. come in and where you can do this. Yep. I think they're positioned better than Uber because they don't have to deal with, a, with the equivalent of a Didi mm -hmm. Chuxing or a Lyft in this business while they're building up. So I think Airbnb has, has the potential to actually be working. And, and we talk it. about Uber at $70 billion. $70 billion in the private markets isn't $70 billion in the public yeah. markets, right? Because yeah. the company that looks dumb or the guys that invested at $70 billion, they get a liquidity preference, yeah. right? So it's and, not really yeah. they're investing at $70 billion, that's, right? That's part of the problem with extrapolating from VC transactions to mm -hmm. the pricing of the entire company. Because unless you know the exact specifics mm -hmm. of how the VC transaction is set up with all the optionality built in, I mean, I, I I actually played a game where I took a $400 million company mm -hmm. and I sold a stake and I wanted to make it look like I was a billion dollar company. And essentially what I did in the game was I said, what kind of options would I need to give? 3X liquidity preference, exactly. whatever it is. And, and yeah. I could cons make a four. So with, especially with the zeal for unicorns mm -hmm. out there, I showed how companies have started playing this game with VCs where both sides kind of do the dance of, hey, mm -hmm. let's make it look like you're a billion dollar company because that attracts more VC investors. 
So you're right, it's a very dangerous extrapolation we're doing. So, but the test will be when they do go public, what that number will look like, you know, whether you can keep that illusion going. And it mm -hmm. seems like many of these companies can do it at least through that initial offering day. Mm -hmm. And it seems like people don't wake up till six months, one year, or one and a half years later to what the actual value of the company is. Okay, Facebook. Facebook to me is a company that has constantly surprised me on the upside because mm -hmm. when they first came out, I wasn't sure that they, I described them as a Google wannabe, which is mm -hmm. not a bad place to be because mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to be like one of the most successful companies of the last decade. Facebook has surprised me to the point where I'm willing to argue that going forward, mm -hmm. if you look at this big fight between, between Google and Facebook, I think mm -hmm. Facebook is going to win that fight huh. in, for the advertising dollars because I think that they constantly keep, when, when you think about stories, they find ways to make their story richer and bigger each time I look at them by bringing uh -huh. in things from the ecosystem. So when they bought WhatsApp, I was actually one of the few people in investing who defended them, saying, you know, because most people say, why would you pay 19 billion, billion yeah. or 20 for a, for a company that doesn't make money? And I said, you're missing the point. What they're buying is richness to the ecosystem, the messenger service that mm -hmm. takes them into the parts of the world where they're weakest. Asia and Latin America, Asia especially, where WhatsApp is, you, was ubiquitous when they bought it. Mm -hmm. They essentially bought the messaging service that a third of the people in India use. Mm -hmm. now. So I think they, to, to, when I look at every action that Facebook takes, it seems to be an action that is designed to make you stay in their ecosystem. The intensity. Well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. 20 billion on a $450 billion market cap for, again, increased intensity yeah. feels, and, feels and, like and, a whole food. Like I, I don't use the word real option mm -hmm. casually because people use it almost as an excuse for paying a premium. Mm -hmm. But this is a case where the optionality you get because your users are so attached to your near ecosystem so long mm -hmm. that Facebook, I don't even know what they can do with these users going forward, but you have 1.9 billion users on your system all the time. Yeah. You'll find ways to make money. Also. Google. Google, the, the thing about that's always surprised me about Google is how they remain an advertising company, mm -hmm. right? They try all this other stuff on the side. You get a lot of, I mean, they get a lot of pu public relations out of every, you know, the Waymo and, but at the end of every quarter, I actually check what percent of revenues comes from old time advertising and it's 95%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I call it the sugar daddy company mm -hmm. because it's a company where the search engine provides so much revenue, so much earnings, so much cash flow. And it's predictable, earnings mm -hmm. and cash flow, that they can experiment doing all kinds of things. Curing death. And I'm not, exactly, and yeah. I'm not sure that's good for a startup right. to have cash you can count on no matter what. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason Google might not have been as successful in the other endeavors is I'm not sure you can behave like a startup if you know you can go back to the parent company for another billion dollars if things don't go right. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm amazed by the cash cow in the, the advertising business, yeah. but I'm also amazed that they haven't found a way to make the rest of their ecosystem at least start on the, I don't even see the starting of a pathway to profitability in most of their other businesses. So undervalued, overvalued relative to the other guys? It's actually, it's close to, I mean, I, Google to me has always been within 10, 15% of value to company. Value. But the, the earnings and cash flows are so immense mm -hmm. that, you know, I, the way I describe it is, you know, when I, when I looked at Google and Apple about eight months ago, is Google is the better business because Apple mm -hmm. has to recreate itself every two years because it's a smartphone company. Mm -hmm. You're only as good as your next iPhone. You know, Google has this business that in the long term will keep generating earnings and cash flows. But I thought Apple was a better investment than Google at that point in time, but Google wasn't significantly overvalued. It was within mm -hmm. eight to 10% of its value. So Apple, huge run up lately. Yeah. What do you think of Apple? I think it is, it is about where I would, exp uh, w I would value it mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And with Apple, whenever I get to that point, I sell the shares because you're now playing the next iPhone game. Mm -hmm. Because the iPhone 8 comes out, it does. So I don't want to play the smartphone game as to what the iPhone. I'll wait for the iPhone 8 to come out, mm -hmm. and here's what I'm looking for. If it doesn't do well, it's almost predictable given the last 10 years of Apple what's going to happen. People are going to sell the shares, drive it down to 80 or 90, and I'm going to be waiting. You think there. you think Apple's going to get cut in half? Well, the way investors in Apple behave, yeah, yeah. You know, that's how, they, they're always one lately? iPhone surprise yeah. away. Yeah. This is a company where the, the story goes from this is the end, they're dead, to mm -hmm. this is a company that's refound its growth, neither of which is true. This is the, the greatest cash machine in history. It's been mm -hmm. the greatest cash machine in history for the last seven years, mm -hmm. but it's a 
it's, it's a mature company. You're not going to get 20% growth now. Mm -hmm. You're going to get 3 to 4% growth, and that's, in a sense, your, 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 your more likely scenario. Mm -hmm. But the market keeps going from believing it's found a 15% growth trajectory to one that says it's going to be dropping by 15% a year. So it's, uh, I've actually bought and sold Apple three, three times in the, in the last 10 years simply because of this up and down movement in the mm -hmm. shares. We talked about Netflix earlier, yeah. up huge, I think 70 or 80 percent just in the last six months. Netflix. I think Netflix, the model has changed, right? It, mm -hmm. I mean, I think well, one thing that always used to, to, to scare me about Netflix is how much they were dependent on other entertainment companies for their basic content. Mm -hmm. And my fear was that they would be held up for, because once they got big, the, the entertainment companies would come to them and say, we want three times more, five times more. And given that you've promised to use us, the movie access, you're going to pay that. What Netflix has done pretty well is changed its focus towards original content. A different right. business. They're entering a dangerous business because we know how the entertainment business works. Egos drive budgets and then budgets get out of control. Mm -hmm. But they've actually managed to create enough of a content business that there are some users who watch Netflix just for their original content. I, thought that, I never thought that would happen. No. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how they build up original content outside the U.S. because it's very clear that their ambitions now are to build up the user base outside. And if you think about outside U.S. and you think about numbers, you think about India and China. Mm -hmm. And um, Marco Polo was a badly focused exercise in trying to get Chinese mm -hmm. users to sign up. But I think that uh, that's where I'll see, I, I see Netflix going, more global, more original content. And it's a company that's uh, that at its current price is, I mm -hmm. think, a little overvalued. I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't buy it, but it's a company which stays on my radar because mm -hmm. I like it as a company. It's one of the few companies where Amazon has tried to enter the space and not been able to try to move Netflix away from its subscription model. And that's that's kind of tough to do. But so original content, yeah. they're spending six and a half billion this year, Amazon spending four and a half. So just to circle back to Amazon, on original content, Amazon is now spending two-thirds or 70 percent of what Netflix is. So at some point they're going to, you, you would think they might be kind of a viable competitor. Uh, Apple and hardware, the most innovative hardware product of the last couple mm -hmm. years, wasn't, wasn't the Apple Watch, wasn't Pods, it was Alexa. Yeah. Facebook and Google, digital marketing, Amazon Media Group, no one ever talks about it. It's a billion and a half dollar Absolutely. company, probably growing faster than Facebook or Google. It feels like the four might be melding to the one, and all the Venn diagram overlaps of Amazon versus everybody else, Amazon is winning. Yeah. That Amazon is now taking on the other, the other three and winning. Is your sense, I mean, is your sense that Amazon really is a viable threat to the other three? It could be, and that's part of what might explain that high valuation we were mm -hmm. talking about for Amazon is it's, it's with, and that's why the Amazon Prime membership is such a rich base to build off because mm -hmm. you got 85 million people who keep coming back to you. I mean, you want to sell them entertainment, they're right there. You don't have to reach out and say, where do I go find these people? Mm -hmm. So right now I get Amazon Prime, for, you know, with Amazon Prime, I get uh, you know, access to most of Amazon media for free. It's an incredible bonus that I'm getting. Yeah. Yeah. I know I'm t th this can't last. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a point in time where this media is going to cost me money. And I actually find Amazon media to be richer than Netflix in terms of the offerings I can mm -hmm. find. Mm -hmm. So you're right. I think Amazon is going to be a competitor to almost every one of the players in this market. It, it doesn't want the advertising stuff. Mm -hmm. But everything else, it's going, to be, it's going to be up there. So it's less of a threat, I think, to Google and Facebook than it is to Apple and Netflix. So Tesla. Tesla is Elon Musk. I mean, let's mm -hmm. face it. You know, it's impossible to invest in Tesla if you don't believe in Elon Musk. So mm -hmm. if you're a believer in Elon Musk, if you think he is the visionary to end all visionaries, I think you'll buy Tesla simply because you're buying a person and his dreams. But the problem with buying a person rather than a company is people come with weaknesses. And mm -hmm. I think Elon Musk's strength is his vision, his weaknesses is inattention to detail. Mm -hmm. And you see this showing up in Tesla quarter after quarter. They're great on the vision, but they can't deliver cars the way they promised to. They're always under-delivering. They're always behind schedule. Mm -hmm. So to me, the moment of reckoning is going to be in 2000, as you look at the Tesla 3 rollout, is whether they can actually deliver. If they can deliver, 
I think they deserve to have a higher market cap than Ford mm -hmm. and GM and mm -hmm. Volkswagen. I mean, maybe not Volkswagen, but essentially companies that have legacy cars that still do business the old way. Mm -hmm. We just saw Volvo announcing that they were going to phase out their gas cars All and electric. going. Yep. So I think the world is shifting, and Tesla might be in a better position to 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 operate in that world than many of the legacy companies. So everyone we've mentioned so far is either fair, fairly valued or what feels like kind of overvalued. Right. Do you look at anything out there right now and think it's undervalued? It's tough in this market yeah. to find undervalued. I mean, we're in a market, it's not tech companies. I've been mean, people blame tech companies for mm -hmm. this. The overall market is richly priced. It's mm -hmm. richly priced, you know, given history. It's perhaps reasonably priced if you factor in low interest rates. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the only way you can say it's, you know, I, I'm okay with this market, mm -hmm. is my opportunity cost is if I don't invest in the stock market, where am I going to go? Mm -hmm. I mean, T-bonds are still delivering 2%. What do you do? Yeah. So in a sense, you're stuck with this, because, but that's a dangerous way to rationalize a market, saying I have no other place to go, therefore, this is not You're saying thing. cash is a viable option. I think cash is a viable option. And I think, you know, when I advise people, I say, look, you know, don't stay out of the market entirely because mm -hmm. the history of people staying out of the market is that they tend to lose over the long term. Mm -hmm. But phase in your investment to the market. So if you have cash to invest, don't put it all at one go. You know, do it over, over stagger it over a period, especially if you're young and you can take, you know, the three months, six months yeah. before you do the investments. Because I think cash is a viable choice. Well, so just as the, the innovation class gets this, what feels like kind of unreasonable rich valuation, right. is there an investment thesis or opportunity around, let's look at Amazon. Right. Um, Amazon announces they're buying Whole Foods and basically, or anytime Amazon announces yeah, anything. anything good, which yeah. is a lot, the rest of retail gets hammered. Right. So, you know, an Abercrombie & Fitch, a Macy's, a Nordstrom, Abercrombie & Fitch is global brand, billions in revenue, six or 800 million in market cap, with 200 million in cash, it feels like it could be sold for scrap. Right. That there might be, or a Macy's trading at what five times cash flow right now. Are these guys? Is there an opportunity with the with the dogs that have been that are basically the victims or the perceived victims of Amazon? Well, if you're a pure retailer, I mm -hmm. wouldn't touch you. You know, so uh, Macy's. I, I walked into Macy's yesterday. and I walked out right away. It's a depressing mm -hmm. place to shop. It's a depressing I think place. that's their tagline. Yeah, and, but I think that's true for a lot of old times. Sears, yeah. Macy's, J.C. Penney. You yeah. go in and you don't feel like it. It yeah. feels like you know, merchandise is thrown all over. There is no rhyme or reason to what they yeah. do. And Abercrombie and Fitch is interesting because you're not just buying, you're buying a brand name as mm -hmm. well. J. Crew. Mm -hmm. right? I think you have to separate the retail space into those who are pure retailers. So basically, mm -hmm. you know, just... And those who might have a brand name that could be valuable. I mean, vertically to, integrated. They exactly. have their own brand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's going to be my, the dividing line because old time retail is in this, watching, it's like watching the Bataan Death March. Yeah. There's no real optimistic end to this game. You know, everything you see is more and more negative over time because I think they, I think they in a sense, you know, dug their own graves because mm -hmm. the way they reacted to Amazon over the last 20 years is they tried to cut costs. To, to improve margins. You can't blame them for doing that, but the way they cut costs is they essentially took away the only reason you'd go into a physical store, mm -hmm. which is to get help, to get you know, service, and they Much cut. merchandising. So they, in a sense, have made it so unpleasant to actually shop in a, in a physical retail store that I'm going to go on my Amazon Prime account and order the same stuff at 20% less and probably get better service by asking an email question than I would in an actual store. What about the victims of Facebook and Google, the Viacoms, the Disneys, the WPPs, the IPGs? Is there opportunity there because they've been beaten up so There badly? again, it's the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. At Disney, for instance, it's, you could take away their, their, their distribution mechanisms and entertainment, mm -hmm. and they're still worth a lot because somebody still has to deliver the content. Mm -hmm. So the companies that have rich content that cannot be taken away from mm -hmm. them will still have value intact. So they'll have to find, re recreate themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, Disney is an amazing company, but they have to think about how entertainment is changing and how they have mm -hmm. to change with the space to survive. And I think every entertainment company right now has to be looking inward saying, what do we need to do to adapt to the world we're in? Which is a world where Amazon and Netflix mm -hmm. might be the gatekeepers through which we end up delivering our content. And I think that that's, so the, comp the, the entertainment companies that truly can own their content. That's why Marvel, Mm -hmm. And Disney Animation are such critical parts of Disney as a company is because those are the things that deliver the content that everybody mm -hmm. needs. 
So the broader market, Jamie Dimon, when asked what a financial crisis is, he said something that happens every seven years. And I love that quote. And for those of us who are old enough to have seen actual cycles, we always say we'll be smarter the next time. This, to me, feels very frothy. A lot of the soft, soft signals, you know, marginal talent demanding a lot of money, crazy rents for office space, difficult to get reservations at marginal restaurants. It does feel like we could have a 20, 30 percent correction and then wake up and go, well, of course we have. Your sense on the general state of markets. I think we've had a long, long, really good run. And every mm -hmm. time you have a long, really good run, there's a correction coming. Mm -hmm. So we, I mean, we can say that safely. There will be a correction. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether it'll be in three months or six months. The question is, what do we do about it? But you think it's months, not years. It could, I mean, it could be weeks. It could be tomorrow. I mean, corrections happen for... If we could find a trigger that causes corrections. We could make a lot of money. The reality mm -hmm. is, if you look at the history of corrections, small things, it's almost like, you know. You don't know where it's coming you from. Don't, you don't know where yeah. it's coming from. So I know there's a correction coming. The question I have to ask myself is, what do I do about it? Mm -hmm. So a few years ago, I asked a question, which is, assume that we're in, a, you know, that, that you think the market's in a bubble. What's mm -hmm. the best strategy? Mm -hmm. The obvious answer is just sell your shares. Mm -hmm. So I asked, what is the probability that the correction has to happen, and how soon does it have to happen for it to be a better strategy to sell your shares and wait than it is to just stay through oh, wow. the market? Yeah. And my tipping points were 70% and a year, which means I have to have a 70% probability of a correction happening within a year mm -hmm. for it to make me, more sense for me to sell my shares and sit on cash than it to just ride through, take the 15% hit when it comes, and keep going. Are we at that 70%? Not for me, not, not yet. And that's because interest rates are still at 2%. If mm -hmm. interest rates went to 4%, Mm -hmm. And markets continue to rise. there'd be a viable competitor to equity. Exactly. You know, at two percent, I'm not quite at the seventy percent probability yet. So, mm -hmm. to me, the uh, where are we? Fifty, sixty, kind of. In I would your say mind? lower than that, simply because at a two percent rate, there is really no other place left for mm -hmm. you to go. That was great. So, uh, online certificate for the first time available to anybody who wants, or online course and valuation. Where do people go to check that out? Well, if they want it for free, they can go to my website. If they want it, want to pay NYU prices, they should go to the Stern website. And <laughs> I'm sure uh, Stern loves you yeah. saying that. And what's your website? Uh, Demodern.com. Demodern.com. And you have a, do you have a book coming out on user growth or our subscribers? I'm starting to write the book. I have a sabbatical. That's, that's one of my big projects in my sabbatical is to, write, is to think about user growth, a value of a user, and then apply it to... Amazon and Netflix and Facebook and Google essentially to look at what the value of the user is in different companies and why they vary across companies. Aswat, thanks very much. Thank Professor you. Aswat Demodaran, more information at demodaran.com, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. We'll see you next week.